good evening and welcome everyone from me as well. Um, I think Nina has explained the idea and the spirit behind this um, uh, forum of events. And um, I have to say that our two authors today, they have met each other 15 minutes ago for the first time. And yet they are supposed to cross each other's path literally. So I think given those circumstances uh, where we want to get to know them, but where they also need to get to know each other, um, we can uh, try a little game with them. So how and Mufoni, please imagine you are both in a cafe in Berlin, in Germany. How is sitting alone at a table? Um, all the other tables are occupied. So Muthoni gets into the cafe. She sees um, Hawa sitting there. She asks her if she can join her at her table. So there are two strangers in the same space. Then uh, they start chatting with each other and they find out they're both authors. So now I want to ask both of you, starting with Muthoni, because she knows about this plot for a little bit longer. Please introduce yourself to Hawa and to us by using five sentences and at least one sentence uh, needs to feature the word goat. Goat. So hi, Hawa. Hi, everyone. Hi. <coughs> I know you're wondering why it's good. Because my name is Modoni and uh, I write as Modoni Wagishuru. And uh, the reason why I got it is because I got it writing because I was a goat hunt. I was having goats as a young child. And when you are out there in the field, all you do is imagine. So I started writing. I started reading a lot when I was young. My mother was a storyteller. And I became a storyteller. So I write short stories. I write for young adults. And I'm also doubling in writing plays. How do you have any questions uh, for her? Um, yes, actually. Is herding goats anything like herding cats? I've heard it's <laughs> very difficult. Is herding cats? No, I don't herd cats. <laughs> have one or two cats. I think goats are easier to control. Goats are actually hard to control. <laughs> she bad it, but goats are hard. But uh, where I grew up, there was a lot of open places. So just let them roam while you don't. And that's how I came around. See, that's how you get people talking to each other. <laughs> just take one word and so they start. So I want to turn the table now to you, Howard. Five sentences uh, for Muthoni and for us. And please use the word autopsy in one of them. Um, um, evening everyone. My name is Hawa Jande Kolakai. I'm from Liberia. And as always, I'm always told by people that I think uh, meeting Liberians is very rare. Um, autopsy was my key word because I'm a scientist and um, I'm a medical immunologist by profession but over the past let's say decade I have slowly edged into my true passion which was writing and I've been writing since I was a young girl like I think I wrote my first book when I was about eight or nine and it was terrible <laughs> it was a comic book I remember it was a comic strip and I used to play it to my friends for 25 cents and they would read it and say, yeah, we love it. And, um, so that's how I, I really got into writing. I was always encouraged by my teachers, but then I went into science because, you know, the day job and the parents and um, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, in 2009, I decided I wanted to know for certain if I was if I had the chops to write for a living, if I was any good. So I thought, okay, I will take this year, um, I will write at night and do my work in the day. And I worked for a hospital in Cape Town. 
and at night I would come home and I used a lot of the ideas that I had learned on the job and I sent to publishers and the rest as they say is history. I I decided well this is this is what I'm gonna do and I'm still an immunologist but <laughs> writing is where my heart is. Thanks, Habo, for your 15 sentences. Muthoni, <laughs> uh, you want to follow up any questions that have opened? <coughs> I, I want to ask you how, because I find that people, especially students in Kenya, who are very good in sciences, hardly are they ever good in creative writing. Mm -hmm. How are you able to do the switch? Or how did, did you always think you could? Um, that's, people often ask me, and to tell you the truth, I don't really have a clear-cut answer. Um, I always had a very curious mind, let's put it that way, and it's easy to switch because the same things that you apply for science and imagination, they work both ways. So I think that's, um, that's um, more or less what it takes to to, to combine and to, to kind of flow between the two and um, science really informs a lot of the things that I write about. I write crime fiction, I also write a lot of speculative and sort of um, horror and so those those genres really you know they fertilize the mind very well for scientific things as well as imagination. So the horror stories you write after you cut out, open those bodies. <laughs> uh, what, what is the difference in when you write a crime story, which is like your first book, very elaborate? And at what point do you feel like, oh, this now, I want this horror out of my head? <laughs> um, I think it's, the idea is like, a, it's, it, for me, it's like a spark. <clears throat> and, um, and when the spark comes, I always need to know the ending. I need to know mm -hmm. who the killer is, and I need to know what the motive is. Then from there, I can create the middle, mm -hmm. however, you know, and build the characters. Because the characters kind of, I think of it sometimes it's like a field. And there's all these people milling around with nothing to do. And when they hear that you're writing a book, they're like, pick me, pick me. And some of them fit in the story and mm -hmm. some of them don't. Mm -hmm. So I know who goes where and who I have to say, look, you need to sit this out next time you get to be a character. Okay. Okay. Um, you already both have told us a little bit what made you uh, be a writer, what made you become a writer. I want to ask you, in what way is the writer that you are today different from the one who completed her first piece of writing? different from the one who imagined the stories while running after the ghosts or <laughs> different from the one who uh, wrote her first book at eight. So, Muthoni, what would you say? I was actually, because of this far, I started writing, this is the first book that I, was, that I wrote that was published, I had written before. And what can I say? I have learned a lot. And sometimes I feel I also need to unlearn a lot. Because <laughs> I wrote this book when I had not attended any workshop or did not be involved with uh, a lot of writers. And uh, there's more authenticity in the book. Now I question myself more. Mm -hmm. But I also think also learning how to like, write a short story. I first wrote a short story in 2015. I've done written for a long, long time. And because I learned how to write it now, my writing is a lot better. You also mentioned Amka to me, what, yes, how it helped you yeah, developing that's yourself. What Amka did. Amka is a, is a group of women and men who meet every last Saturday of the month. I'm now coordinating the meetings. And that's actually here at the where, Winter Institute. Yeah, here, yeah. upstairs. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned the, the craft of writing a short story. Because this I wrote because I have read a lot. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm writing is because I also am learning the craft. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. It's a continuous process. And but of course it's also, it's also a process where you mentioned to me when you came to your first AMCA meeting or the first time you yes. introduced this. I hope I, it's okay if I tell you that. Because I think every writer goes through it. <coughs> 
you uh, got quite some criticism. My story was trashed. Trashed. If I were a person of a lesser courage, I would have said, no, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. Mm -hmm. It was trashed. But within a, I just sat and listened and learned. And in 2015, I wrote a short story, which was on pages, which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth. And I said, I know this thing. But still, you keep on learning. Mm. You become better with time. The more you do something, the better you become at yes. So how do you deal with criticism? How do you also have a forum where you share your writing, get criticized, thrashed, disappointed? Um, yeah, I think I think it's essential as a writer because it's such a solitary job, mm. a solitary pursuit. And if you wouldn't give it to you know your mom and you, you know the people that you know, your friends. They will tell you, oh, it's wonderful. And then you go out there looking for a publisher, thinking that the publishers are against you and it's a whole conspiracy, but actually your writing is just bad. So it's it's really important to have, you know, critically minded people who um, are in the writing business as well, but they will give you constructive criticism and they'll, they'll help you, you know, they'll tell you positive things but they will tell you the way to shape your work so that you don't know that it, you know, it is not about taking offense. And, um, because writing, um, you can get trapped in your head a lot. And um, I think with crime, as it is with any fiction, you can flow along a path and you stay on that path and you finish the work and then you realize that, oh, I really didn't want the story to go this way. Mm -hmm. And if you had just outsourced or asked people or done more research, you will find that you know you could have you know you could have snipped it in the bud earlier. So I think it really is, it's very important to have people to share your work with. Mm -hmm. And like she says, to unlearn a lot of the things that you learned before because I used to write like volumes, I would write so much and I would think that you know, more is more mm. <laughs> and more is not more. There's a lot of junk that you put out and that's, you know, trust the editing process as well. Editing is just as important as the writing. Mm. I think I think even more so. The more that I've become more mature in my writing, I, I trust my editing even more and trust other people's editing skills. Mm. You mentioned earlier that uh, when you write a crime story, you know already at, when you start writing who is the killer and what the characters are. There are other authors who have told us in this forum that uh, when they write and they get immersed in the process, they feel like the characters take on their own lives mm -hmm. and they just have to follow them. There's, as if they are um, detached from them, as if these are people they are just observing and writing down what they do. So you don't have that approach. Um, I think it's, for me it's a combination. I think um, for me personally to think that um, as a writer you are just a vessel and you flow and I think it's a little too precious for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's how, that's not how my methodology mm -hmm. works. You know, I, you are a scientist I am a bit of a slave and a bit of a god at the same mm -hmm. time. So I know which role to adapt at which point. I find that just going where the characters want, it doesn't really work for me because sometimes the characters want some stupid <laughs> want some stupid stuff. And then you just yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to go here and you do this. Mm -hmm. You don't tell me what to do. Okay, how's that with you, my phone? I think that thing of characters wanting to go their way is there, but uh, you, with time, you also learn to be a disciplinarian. Yeah, <laughs> you have to disciplinarian. them and, and tell them. Although sometimes something will come up, or I'll see something, because I do mind my stories a lot from people, mm -hmm. and somebody will say something, and I see that one I can use, and then I'll use it. But I, I try as much as possible without being a control freak to mm -hmm. control what the characters say. And like, there's so much that you can write which is not will not fit into the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, let's get a taste of what she has been able to control.
So, Muthoni, I would like to ask you to uh, read us uh, a little bit an, ex an excerpt from your short story, The Itch. Um, you write for children and for young adults, if, which is a genre or classification, um, but you also write for grown-ups, you write short stories for us, adults. <laughs> Um, and the itch is one of those products and it depicts events um, of the post-election violence in Kenya in early 20, 2008. So please give us a taste of your writing. Okay, um, uh, I'm reading this story that has not been published because it's just shortlisted and I'm trying to get it to be published. But um, I'll, I'll read a bit of it. She dropped the pot because she needed to scratch. And the leech came with an urgency that could not be ignored. It was in the armpit, then at the nape of the neck, and before she could scratch there, it moved the small of her back. She scratched frantically, but she could not beat the itch. It seemed to be teasing and taunting her. Now it was moving along the calf of the right leg, and then it was at the crotch, and bones screamed with the torment of it. This is the third pot you've broken. What's wrong with you? Oye's uncle Buto asked her as she gathered the pieces. The itching subsided and boy seemed to come back to herself. She looked at him the way someone looks at a person they have suddenly recognized. Are you going out of your mind? And Koboto asked him. Boy walked away from him without answering. She felt nauseated with the strong smell of filterless cigarettes Boto smoked. Then I'll, I'll skip a bit and come to the second page. The age had become unbearable the day they had found the decomposing body of her mother in the bushes near home. The flesh was almost gone, but one foot still had a shoe, although termites had built mud tips along its length. The brown sweater, which her mother was wearing when the raiders came, had soaked the blood of the machete wound on her neck and had turned the color of red ochre. Boy was surprised of the richness of her mother's remains. A few bones, a little fresh, that clung to the bones. It was as if her mother's life had been summed up and found worthless. That night, the eating had become so intense that Boy felt as though thousands of lives were crawling all over her body. Boy could not sleep. Whenever grossness overcame her, she would see them like she did every night. They appeared suddenly from early dusk. In her dream, the walls of the house of Agnes and the readers could walk through them. She heard again her mother's high pitched scream, tearing the silence and the insistent barking of dogs. Her mother was darting about, first looking for a place to hide, and then looking for a way out. And the young man, the face was covered with bananas, advanced towards her. Boy felt again the fear that made her mouth dry as he hid under the itara. The place where they stored firewood in the kitchen. She saw the readers corner her mother. Boy heard her mother pleading with the readers in her mother tongue. A tongue boy and her family spoke so well, just like their own, after living as neighbors for years. The readers closest to her mother had lowered the hard wood in a machete, and Boy's mother had run outside. Boy had a war cry from the readers, and her mother assumed screaming, resumed screaming, which came to an abrupt end. Boy felt again the raw fear and the smell of kerosene filled her nostrils. She heard again the cracking of burning wood as the kitchen, made of scrap wood, where she was hiding corn fire. She saw herself running through the flames that leaked at her clothes. The sickening <coughs> fear that she had felt came back to her. She remembered hearing the footfalls behind her as she ran into the main field next to the main house. She felt again the faces go to the head that had brought her down. Boy's all, boy always jumped away. Her dreams always ended at that point, but she knew the horrors of that night had not ended there. She had seen the blood between her legs and felt the soreness and pain when she regained consciousness at the police post. And then towards the end, this is towards the end of the story. When Boy and Kim met Kibet seven months later, the threads of the symbols of partition she wore had come and done and ended in flaps around her to the display. <coughs> the scar she wore had low over her hips and her stomach protruded through the t-shirt under the cap. You were there that evening, boy told him. I heard you talking to my mother, with my with mother. 
I did not kill your mother. I swear to God on this. He begged Sam, touching the soil with his forefinger and licking it. Boy wanted to believe me. They had been classmates at the time she was in nursery school. You are there, boy insisted. The only stone which joined them and helped to fed my community. I knew if I did not participate, I would become a pariah among my own people. I was told they would give burn a few houses, houses and threaten people. I never wanted to kill anyone. When the other young men were chasing my mother, I took a different direction and I saw you running. I hate you. You are the one who hit me on the head. What happened to me? Who did this to me? Boy asked, touching her face. You are running straight to some warriors who are in the main field. I knocked you down and I hit you for a while in the main field until I saw Boy drop your ankle. Come upon me. Then I left. You do not rape me? Boy asked. I did not rape you. Bed said and walked away. So yeah. for the rest of the story, we have to wait for the publication. Yes. Muzoni, how do you get into the head of your character? I want to be this. No, seriously. What I usually do is do something that is <coughs> mundane while my mind is engaged with that. But I was so engaged with this story when I was writing it, I wrote it when I was very angry. Uh, we had this, the ICC case, and uh, the ICC evicted had been set free. Mm. But then, that's hence the age. Then why, why do we pretend that everything is okay? Is it like covering up and we say we are celebrating? And people are calling me and writing on Facebook and WhatsApp that we are happy, we are free now. And I was thinking that person who was raped, who has a son who got it, the he, that's somebody who is relatives died. That pain is going to continue. It's still continuing up to now. Mm. And I was so angry. After they wrote this one in one sitting, I did a lot of rewriting then, but I wrote it in one sitting. I was also angry. So I was now I was able to imagine what I would be feeling if I were happy. Mm. Um, I, I, I try to be the character from them. Okay. Or to really imagine what. Mm. So the events that you're describing in the story have been very much on everybody's minds or experience <coughs> like that have been shared in the public space yes. very much in the months and the years yes. after the post-election violence. Um, and you chose very deliberately the characters that you chose. You chose yes. a young woman who was raped and yes. she is <coughs> trying to find out by who. Um, this is a, I mean, for a woman to get raped, I think that's the worst thing that could ever happen. Nice. So, yes, that is exactly what I want to find out from you. How, how does your imagination work to make your characters <coughs> believable? A young woman who was raped and you don't share that experience and yet fortunately and yet you managed to meet and then I hope everybody else believes that this could actually have happened. I this the stories of rape have been happening so much. Even when I was growing up, the stories were happening. But no one would talk much about it. It was like something that some people are ashamed of, I don't know what happened, but people speak with this in other terms or even use words that are not really not mm -hmm. like that. But I was I, I always try to think that uh, something like intimacy you give uh, yourself. And if somebody takes that violently from you and forces itself on you, it must be the worst thing. Mm -hmm. I have dealt there was a time we were attacked by thugs in a place I was staying in. I wasn't, people, they didn't see me come. But I was thinking, even that such an invasion of privacy, mm -hmm. it's an invasion of myself. So I can imagine now somebody forcing my, themselves on me. It must be the most, most, most terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and, mm -hmm. and tried to. So the story, writing the story was something like an outlet for you. Yeah, the anger was, that you felt. Mm -hmm. I've actually I've written two stories about rape because even this one is about rape. Mm -hmm. Actually, because I write 
they, this one I wrote in the past, past one, somebody asked me, so what are the goals for you? <laughs> I don't know where to go. So mm. just somebody told me a, a new story and I wrote it. Mm. So they are just fiction, it's fiction, yeah. but based on so many stories that have been happening. We are getting to break the silence a little bit later on. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, I would like to give Hawa also the chance to read some of her writing. It's a very, very different story, um, which you can already tell by the title, which is Candy Girl. And Candy Girl is a text that uh, was published in the Valentine's Day Anthology uh, 2015, published by Ankara Press, alongside contributions of our very own, if I may say, Binya Banga and Naina Bili Kamura. And, um, I hope you enjoy. How? Oh, go ahead. Um, uh, so the story is entitled um, "Candy Girl," and it is set in it's it's set in Monrovia. Um, it's 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 a short one. So. Grab her legs. I should do wedding. Hey, my people, look at trouble. You not serious for truth? Shaking my head. I tried to prop Leonora up by the shoulder, making sure her head turned away because that plotted spit oozing over the peeling red lipstick on her on her chin is no wet dream. Then I crouch and low I crouch low and heave. My wife is no small woman. Once I've lifted her torso off the floor, I look up. Siata, really? Was she serious? I'm here breaking my back and my so-called lover is over there with her arms crossed, looking on like I'm a psycho, like I've just asked her to kill somebody. Okay, poor choice of words, considering the situation. I jerk my head wildly in the direction of Leonora's feet, urging her to jump in any time. Siata still doesn't budge, instead draws her arms tighter and just her hips. Sia, come on! I lose it, and then damn it because my back loses it, popping a tendon or something else that isn't supposed to pop. Grinding my pain between my teeth, I drop Leonora, who does quite an impressive place, face plant onto the carpet. Fan chill, I beg you, before somebody can bust inside here and find out what we're doing. We, I will take my spine, trying to unclench, more like what I'm doing. If you're not interested in saving my neck, I don't see why you're here. I blame you. I came. That's why you're telling me nothing. She cocks her head away from me. Classic move when she's trying to control that spitfire temper. She's not pissed. Not really. I can tell. Anger runs a whole different tier in spectral shades with her. She looks around the room, deciding if she approves. If I chose well, despite the shift storm this has turned into. From the tiny smile that crooks upon the edge of her mouth, I know I did good. Clean and respectable, but not high-end. Romantic, but seedy enough for debauchery. A tough combo to get right in this nosy Monrovia. She beckons with the crook of her finger, and I notice for the first time a French manicure with a tiny red heart stuck onto each nail. Why would something I'd normally find so cheesy make me want her more? I go to her like a little boy. What happened? She coos, massaging me. Tiny knots dissolve like sugar to caramel. You see what happened? My wife is dead. I point to the body, which I'm past hoping will wake up, stagger to its feet, and cuss my ass out. <clears throat> Tell me exactly. Tell me articulated in your fine white people English. What happened? I ignore the jive. She's not trash, but she plays up our differences. And although I, pro I protest, that edge of frisson it adds, hot damn, who knew I knew how to mess around? In looks, my Jew is like my wife. It's so like my wife, I shouldn't have bothered cheating. Night and day though, take for instance the outfit. Leonora, champion at making pretty love and eye contact, straight out of a corny rom-com with her red trench coat, fancy black frills underneath, no doubt. Siata in the very lapa I tore off her the first time we ravaged, with those hideous tiger print heels that slaughter me every time they're up in the air. She was sitting on the bed when I walked in. 
I don't know how, but she found out about your surprise and genuinely thought it was for her, I think. What could I do? And then she opened up the box of chocolates. Once the reaction starts, it's unstoppable. She's so sensitive. She's always carrying her, she's always careful about <coughs> carrying her EpiPen around. But clearly dressing like a hooker took me to take me by surprise, took precedence this time. Well, the girl didn't think her husband was gonna kill her on Valentine's Day. I didn't, I choke on a sob and she kisses me. We need to get rid of the body. No, nowadays you can't try that. You need to get your story straight. When she looks up, she, sorry, she looms over my wife, unblinking. When she looks up, her eyes glitter, so dark and sultry in the moonlight, like oil dancing on top of ink. I know I'll wreck my entire life for her, now and always. Nobody saw me coming, so that part is okay. So how will, how would I explain this? Yes, yes. Tell them, I always order candy for you. My mom and my special, my mom and a special box for her. In my hurry to get here, I grabbed the wrong box. And that's how this catastrophe happened. Thank God the other boxes are safe at home. I'll destroy the, uh, the extra one meant for my mom and use the candy as proof of the mix up. There you go, flower finny, that mistake. We're bad luck for your name, red banana will break your teeth. She laughs at my own. You looking inside my box that my teeth made a dam diamond. I told you I'm not only good for one thing. She crosses to the bed and I drink in every muscle, shifting under the same wrapper. I shouldn't be tingling right now, but why am I tingling? How long has it been? She says. I check my watch. 20, 25 minutes. Good. Any more than an hour and it looks bad. After I leave, be ready to give the performance of your life. After you give me the performance of your life. She drops the colorful lapper. Her body is heaven turned on its head. She picks a truffle from the box and runs it over her neck. Don't, I grab. Why not? I'm not the one with a nut allergy. So why do you make me buy it? You always tell me these chocolates are too sweet. Which girl can ever be too sweet? She crooks her finger at me. I'm going to hell a thousand times over. Thank you, Howard.